tomorrow, isn't that mm -hmm. right? Up to Wolverhampton tonight. Wolverhampton. Well, I'm sorry that you didn't uh, beat this lot, but yes. uh, successful wine tasting, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
Our Gracie Fields, the first lady of variety. This is your life. You were born at 9 Molesworth Street, Rochdale, in a homely little flat above a fishing town. I still smell of them. <laughs> <laughs> in 1959, the townspeople proudly erected a plaque, this plaque here, to mark the room where you were born. Now, in those, as an exceedingly noisy baby, you were far from being a local idol. And over the years, your mother used to relate the neighbors' comments. Could you tell us what it was they used to say? Well, I couldn't tell you in their, a lot of their words. But they said, throw her through the window, do everything, get rid of her, drown her. <laughs> <laughs> That's some of them. We've got a few others as well, but we yeah. won't tell them now. <laughs> yes. I know that as a child, you went to the local parish school, and when you were there in trouble, there was one particular small boy you used to turn to for help. Oh, no, not again. Pass your book over. It's time you learn to do your own sums. Now, you haven't seen him for 50 years. Right from the top of the class, Arthur Winterbottom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you sit down there, Gracie. Do you remember to... him well, don't you? I remember him because he used to wear boots. I know I liked all the people that wore boots. I had to wear clogs, you see. <laughs> so there were about three that wore boots, Arthur Nichols, Arthur Winterbottom, I don't remember the other one, and then two of the girls, <laughs> Cicely Smith and Gr Mel uh, uh, Flurry Green. Yeah. <laughs> they all wore boots. I wore clogs. I wanted to be posh. <laughs> Tell me, Arthur, did Gracie often... Um, ask you to do her sums for her? Whenever she got a chance, she would just nudge me <laughs> and say, Arthur, do me sums. <laughs> and you <laughs> did. How's she then? Oh, about ten. Uh -huh. Did you ever hear her sing? Oh, yes. When the headmistress in the junior school was marking the registers, she used to give us some work. And it was quiet. As compensation afterwards, she'd stand Gracie on a chair before the class to give us a song. I also also remember our stockings used to hang like cords round her skinny legs. <laughs> <laughs> we better skip over that one. Did you think she was very good then? Oh, in those days, we thought she was wonderful. I bet you do, as you do now. Thank you very much, Mr. Winterbottom, for coming. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. you. Well, ah, Gracie, you're soon a favorite at the local smoking concerts. How did you usually get paid for these, do you remember? Four tuppenny pies. Now I think the tuppenny pies have gone to sixpence and a shilling. <laughs> they have, and when a local performer there was getting up a benefit concert, he went round to ask your mother if you could take part. Her worry was what you could wear. In her own unbeatable way, she succeeded in rigging you out. And there you are, or should be, but you're not on that screen, Grace Stansfield, Rochdale's clever child vocalist. Now, a year or so later, you join a juvenile troupe and go off on tour at eight shillings a week. Although you try very hard to look older, you're still only a naive 12. Now, touring conditions then were very tough. You become ill, and you're sent to a convalescent for six months. When you return home, your father says, that's enough. You're to go into the mill like the rest of the local girls. But you go into the mill, you last only a few weeks, because you get the sack for distracting them by singing for them and making them laugh. And then you join the troop. Cherburn's Juvenile. Charburn's. Charburn's, yeah. pardon me. And this time, <laughs> this time you tour for over two years. At 17, you get your first speaking part in review, and years of touring small dates follow. Dressing rooms with broken windows, fire buckets for wash basins, scratch meals, dingy lodgings, and eternal traveling and waiting on drafty stations. It was all wonderful. I've, <laughs> it doesn't sound it when I say it like that, but I'm sure it was. <laughs> when you're a kid, you don't notice it. I bet you don't. I would now. <laughs> <laughs> 1922, Mr. Tower of London, in which you've been playing the lead for some of the provinces, fills an unexpected vacancy at the Alhambra Theatre, London, 
and you become a star overnight. In 1926, another review, by request, followed, and a cheeky young teen-year-old dancer joined the show. Quite good. I'll have you know I can kick nine inches above my head. From the 1923 chorus of By Request, Joan Sinclair, now Mrs. Young. Joan, while you were in the chorus, Sissy was playing the lead. Did you get to know her at all? I'll say I did. <laughs> she used to come down every morning to rehearsals and practice with us. And it made it into such a wonderful family show that the fact of Grace being a star dawned on us. Did you ever see her at all when you weren't working? Oh, yes. She we lived in the same digs. We right? did. <laughs> <laughs> she once took me to for a flying holiday to Dublin. And uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> while we were there, she was asked to draw the tickets for the Dublin sweepstake. And only Grace would do it. Somehow she managed to fall in the drum. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joan Young. Thank you. I'll see you later. Bye bye, Boris. <laughs> she could tell us a lot of stories and we have some for time. <laughs> but <laughs> Were you? Yeah. There you are. Now during this period you begin making the recordings which people have treasured ever since. All over the world in baronial halls or little back, people have gone on laughing at the, the biggest aspidus from the world. That we've got to chop it down. <laughs> <laughs> or marveling at the lovely Toselli Serenade. or any of the many others that you made. The sales of your records soon exceeded those of any living artist of the States. Do you remember the celebration party for your four millionth record? Yes. I bet you do. <clears throat> the same year you appear in the first of your eight Royal Command shows. You tour America, South Africa, and play to packed houses. In 1930, you enter the world of films and immediately start breaking box office records with pictures like the show goes on. Love, life, and laughter. Say go. And working on the studio floor, whilst you were making Sing As We Go, was a young assistant who was later to become one of the outstanding names in the film world. A few days ago, just before he was to board a plane, he filmed a message to you. I do wish I could have been with you tonight, Gracie. You know, Eamon, I wanted another side of Gracie. I was very small fry in the studios in those days. I was an assistant director on Sing As We Go, Looking On The Bright Side, and of course, Sally. But my job really was to see that Gracie write clothes for the particular scene that we were making, to see that she knew her dialogue, what's, what's, what the dialogue was in the scene, and to keep her informed about when we were shooting a certain number. Well, lots of mistakes were made. The would be changed, and then, therefore, the costume or the number would be altered. And it was my, our department to keep Gracie informed about this. And I remember how she always used to cover up for our mistakes. Whatever mistake it was, she would come down in the, in the clothes that were wrong for the scene because we hadn't informed her. And it was always her who said, no, 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 they were all right. I was a fool, I just put on the wrong costume. I remember one particular case on Sing As We Go, a very big number to play, and she went on for about three minutes, and at the end of it, she had to walk to the door, play a couple of lines, turn the handle, and make her exit. Trouble was, the door didn't work. Cut the canvas, the man who was responsible for it, the property man in back, was called and on the carpet for it. And I remember the first thing that Gracie said was, no, 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 she said, it was my fault. I just turned the handle the wrong way. It was this sort of thing that endeared Gracie to us in those days in the studio. 
Good night, Gracie. Thank you, Sir Carol Reed. Uh, it was in your very first picture, Sally, that you first sang the song, which has been remembered ever since as belonging particularly to you, Sally. Now, the name Gracie Fields has become world famous, but you started life as Grace Stansfield. Do you remember how the suggested change came about, or who it was suggested to change your name? I think it was a little agent in Manchester who said she'll never be a star with a name that long. Grace Stansfield's far too long. So then mothers think, well, we'll call her Stanna Fields. No, that's daft. Off the stance will call her Gracie Fields. Now, that's how I remember, as far as I remember it. Yes, that's part of it, but in fact, there was someone else very closely involved. Uh, your mother went along to Brining's works. That's right. Uh, there was a Mr. Brining there who's now 93 years old and, yes. like you, a freeman of Rochdale. Yes. He's here tonight, oh, Alderman C.H. Brining, OBE, <laughs> JP. Oh, <laughs> Come all the way to have a look at you. Oh, I bet you have. Now, will you tell us, because we were trying to recollect his memory here, how you remember coming to change her name? When Gracie was a girl about 15 or 16, taking a few my engagements in the town, her mother who always believed that Gracie would one day be a star. Oh, it would be more professional if she could have some cards printed with her name and address. And so being near came to our works and ordered some. And that's when the suggestion, anyhow, came up as far as you were concerned. What was wrong with her own name, Stansfield? Too long. That's it real. was just too long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was uh, nothing was wrong with it, except uh, that it was thought to be rather long, uh, difficult to remember, and... Uh, after some uh, looking round, the name was contracted to Fields. And subsequently became world famous. Now, Alderman Browning, you uh, suggested Gracie's nomination to the freedom of Rochdale, mm -hmm. and I know that you were present yourself on this memorable occasion. We have, I think, a little piece of film of it. Mm -hmm. In this big world of ours, Hey. This casket is going to go with me. And I'm never so happy as when I'm telling folks how I am of our Rochdale and of its gradely folks. Well, now I want you to try to recall, Alderman, what you said on that occasion. I talked to them. I talked to them about her unfailing loyalty to Rochdale for her assistance in coming to assist us with our charitable affairs, for her generous gifts, and above all, for the uh, y warm human heart which is hers, which has endeared her 
to millions of people all the world over. Well done, and thank you, all of you. Thank you. We've got good voices You're in Dutch there, haven't we? Just thank you. You, you, oh, you will indeed. Okay, all the money. I don't We've know got what's good in voices in Rochdale, yeah. haven't we? Can't half make it go up. <laughs> now we know where she gets the voice from, and he's 93. What? Marvellous. <laughs> the year 1938, Gracie, was a great milestone in your life, and that year you became the first woman in the variety profession to be awarded the CBE. In the same year, Manchester University awards you the honorary degree of Master of Arts. Later, you're made a sister of the Order of St. John of Jerusalem. You have, in fact, reached the pinnacle. And at this pinnacle of your career, you command a fabulous salary. Your mom crowds wherever you go. Our Gracie is a national figure. For years now, you've worked long, grueling hours, giving every ounce of your strength and energy, never refusing a charity show when it was possible to squeeze it in, but for all this, pay a high price. In June 1939, utterly exhausted, you go into hospital for a severe operation. The whole nation waits anxiously for the daily bulletins published in the press. Over a quarter of a million letters, grams, and an avalanche of flowers arrive to wish you well from the greatest to the lowest in the land. Among the people who waited anxiously for news were the children of the Gracie Fields Orphanage at Peacehaven, which you endowed in 1935. These are the children who, over the years, brought such happiness to you, I know. We have a picture here of a little girl who, you're with some of them on that picture, of a little girl who you every night in her prayers. There she is praying that you'll get well. She was one of the three sisters that you had at the home at the time. They're all married now, of course, but they're here. Barbara, Doreen, Margaret, <laughs> daughter Yvonne, and Barbara's son, <laughs> Stephen. Oh, thank you very much. They're lovely. They're good. No, let them stay with they're all right. Uh, Doreen, how old were you when you first went to Peace Haven? How old were you? Is this your daughter? Uh, no, this is Yours. Martha. Tell her to shut up for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> You're a lovely girl. Ah, let me hear that. You were how old? Two and a half. Two and a half. Well, that was very young to leave home, wasn't it? Yes, but the great thing was I had my sisters with me. Gracie insisted on not splitting up families at Peace Haven. And there was a full homely atmosphere there. So we've heard. And, and Barbara, did Gracie come to see you often? Oh, yes, whenever she was in the country, she would to come and see us and we used to have sing songs and we used to read us stories. Uh -huh. <laughs> Margaret, you remember the sing songs, don't you? Yes, and I can remember more about Ferdinand and the bull. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time you'd finished, we could almost see the bull jumping about. <laughs> well, I can tell you, these two young bulls are going to jump about, so you'll have to see them later on. Thank you very much, Margaret, Barbara, <laughs> yeah, Yvonne, yeah, and Stephen. Lovely. Well done. Lovely flowers. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Thank you very much for your flowers. Now, thank goodness you make a remarkable recovery, but you're still a very sick woman. You're warned not to work for two years. You go to Capri to convalesce. In September, war is declared, and you're one of the first artists to go over to France to entertain and do it. A member of the party was the creator of this famous friend of the bookmakers, Tishy. Famous cartoonist Tom Webster. Oh. <laughs> Tom, tell me, how was Gracie looking by the time you all arrived in Dewey? Well, she looked very ill and drawn. And uh, sometimes she seemed to be looking for something to give her support. Perhaps it was for you, love. <laughs> very likely I needed it. But uh, she got the support all right. The moment she went on the stage. How did she manage the show? I mean, I couldn't tell you, but she... Uh, the good Lord. <laughs> well, he was with you that night. That's all right. She faced a terrific barrage of applause. And 
one time I really thought she was going to collapse. Then, suddenly, she put her two fingers in her mouth. Gracie, can you do it now? No. <laughs> oh! <laughs> well, that uh, put everything all right, and they wouldn't let her go. The troops, I mean. She's a pretty good trooper herself, really. <laughs> they wouldn't let her go, and she had to sing all the old favorites. Well, she naturally wanted them to join in the chorus, so she beckoned to me on the side of the street and she asked me to print the words on my easel. It was a pretty tough job to keep up with her. <laughs> and I never knew songs had so many words. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom Webster. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Gracie, throughout the war years, you continued singing for the troops with ENSA and USO and in all the allied war theaters, Australia, India, North Africa, Italy, and Greece across the Atlantic in convoys, and returning from one of your trips to American Canada, there was another famous Lancastrian on board. That wonderful voice needs no introduction. Famous opera star, Eva Turner. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Eva, was that, <laughs> was that the first That's time wonderful. you met Gracie? Yes, it was. Of course, being both being Lancastrians, we had so much to talk about. <laughs> That's right. Did you ever see her on the stage? Oh, yes, many, many, many times. We've seen each other. <laughs> <laughs> she came to see me, too, and to hear me. When she came to Covent Garden, and so clearly she came round to see me, and then afterwards we walked together through the market. And I remember that all the porters, oh, they were simply thrilled to see her. There was I, who round the corner with Gillian Martinelli, they didn't know me from Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Eva, what, what did you think of her voice? Quite remarkable. Once, do you remember, Gracie, you asked me if you had uh, really Die, if you had really done the right thing. That's right, yeah. Because Mother always wanted me to go in opera. She wanted me to be Madame Patty. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, you, uh, uh, I really think you, you should have studied singing seriously. And I said no, because I thought you had a quite unique gift. I remember once hearing you sing Malotte's arrangement of the Lord's... There was not a sound in that vast, packed audience. And the people around me, they were all crying silently. This I could never, never forget. Gracie wanted them. She saw that they were sad, and she wanted them to be happy. So what do you think she did? Suddenly, she frowned and she scratched her back. <laughs> oh my, that was just like a pistol shot. <laughs> oh, the place roared and rocked with delight. <laughs> bless you, Gracie. <laughs> bless you, bless you, bless Thank you. Thank you, Eva Turner. Thank Is you. this your husband? <laughs> I'm delighted to meet you. Come to your chair. Come to your chair. 1944, the Opera House Rome. You're playing among a distinguished at a charity concert when from behind you on that enormous stage you hear an agonized whisper. I can't. I have no music. Oh. <laughs> Famous pianist, Semprini. <laughs> yeah, obviously, Gracie remembers. How did you come to have no music? Well, the fact was that... Um, I was supposed to do a solo spot before accompanying Gracie in her act. And um, after my solo, I got up from the stool, walked towards the audience, acknowledged the applause, and they wanted an encore. So back I went to the stool and started playing Chopin. Gracie somehow was distracted in the wings off stage, and uh, she didn't realize what was going on. And all of a sudden, on she walked, singing at the top of her voice, 
Sally, Sally. <laughs> and I'm Chopin. <laughs> Tell me, what, you what? He went right into Sally. You see, he played it so perfectly. Well, it was a bit of a mix-up, so he went straight into Sally. At the I end of the chorus, Gracie walked back towards the piano and said, Have I done something wrong? I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said You have? I haven't got into music. So with a very sweet smile, she calmly said, well, go and get it, Lowell, and I'll tell them a story. <laughs> Thank you, Sam Freeney. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, you've always been very quick to appreciate and encourage London others. In 1951, you went to watch the ice show London Melody at the Empress Hall. With the curtain call, the audience demand to see you. To please them, you join the cast, but quite unexpectedly, instead of taking a bow yourself, you walk along the line of artists, pick up the little man playing the comedian, carry him forward to the microphone and say, here within two years, you're going to have one of the world's greatest comedians. That prophecy became true, because for the last five years, he's been voted top British screen comedian. Norman Wisdom. <laughs> Tell us, what, what happened after that performance of London Melody? Well, the press gathered round, if you remember, and yeah. you assured them that what you said you really did mean, which made me very happy too. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, the day you, you were making a record, uh, and you invited me along to the studio to have a cup of tea with you, do you remember? Yeah. And I came down there, you wanted to know how, your, how the reaction to your statement had gone for one thing, and you wanted to know more about me because you hadn't seen me before. I went mad on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know the, the, the publicity and was of enormous value to me, and uh, the agents and people from the theatre actually started to come to see me then. So. Oh, is that did, you, did you meet yeah, again, again after that? Oh, many times, yes, yes. yes, yes. yes. We've done three command performances together That's right. and many charity shows. And I would like to thank you, Gracie, for such a generous gesture. Oh, God and, bless you. Well, I love you as everybody else does. You, you, you give leg up when they need it most. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Norman Wilson. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there's so much, as you know, that we have. But only last year, you were invited to travel to Naples, one of the world's most picturesque cities to sing. But not to sing to a wealthy opera house audience, but to Schkunitzi. Ah. Is that how I say it? The urchins of the Naples back streets. The children who have no place to sleep and who stole to live until Father Mario Borelli gathered them together in his amazing urchin's town. Now, Don't we... sing anything sad. They have enough of sadness on their life. That's the one man these urchins would accept, the priest who lived with them in the gutter so that he could build them a new life from urchin's town, Naples, Father Mario Borelli. <laughs> Father Borelli, these were, these were Neapolitan children. They, they must have heard many singers and many songs. Uh, the people of Naples uh, uh, sing wherever they feel like it. And wherever they are, they are um, usually very good. But with Gracie Field, it was very difficult because she is an, an English woman. And uh, I have an idea of how they have accepted her. Well, my pigeon <laughs> Italian, I think it was, you know. Where, where in fact, did she sing? Oh, she sang in our church on Mother Day, yeah. in uh, Archenstown. But uh, our boys are quite uh, tough. Quite uh, tough. <laughs> they, uh, they haven't survived if it had not been, you know. But they, well, they just reacted as if I was speaking almost English to them. It was half English and half Italian mixed up. I never get anything right. My husband's the linguist. I leave it to him. And when I don't understand, I say, what's he say? You know. <laughs> that, I think it's just the way you, you sort of go into these things. You see the lot of kids, you've just got to go make noises and come on. Let's have fun. Let me go. 
How did the boys react when she sang the song? Well, these boys are uh, very tough. Sat spellbound, and listening to her and, uh, and the hand, they burst into the big applause. <laughs> <laughs> into big applause and we join those children in applauding you Gracie for all the years of your hard work and the wonderful artistry which have brought joy into all over the world. Gracie Fields, CBE, idol of millions. This is your life. Thank you.